Please welcome David. Hello, hello, I'm David. Uh, yes, I came all the way from Santa Cruz, California, uh, but I'm, I'm pretty lucid right now, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, I'm going to talk about a project of mine. Um, I've been working on it for, it feels like forever, uh, at least seven, seven or eight years um, since starting this project. It's called the Happy Valley Band, um, and it has a lot to do with kind of the questions, um, in particular the questions from this morning of what can musical performance um, bring to this question of machine, machine listening. Uh, so that's me, the composer and band leader of the group. Um, this project, I like to say that it's pop music uh, as heard by a computer algorithm. Um, a few other descriptions that people have given uh, include a, a shitty MP3 to MIDI converter, uh, the shags meets guitar hero, uh, the best executed worst idea, and James Brown backed by Sun Ra. Uh, I know, right? It's a pretty good, that's why I lead with that. It's just a really good list of descriptors. Um, basically, this project is about taking uh, machine listening representations of music and then playing them, getting a band uh, to perform them. Um, the process of making the music uh, is sort of in a, a, few, a few steps. Um, the first process is a source separation step where I uh, extract the individual instruments from a mixture. Um, I then run this through a music analysis or transcription stage to uh, find the pitches and the rhythms, um, playing techniques, durations uh, in the extracted individual instruments. Um, then take these extracted instruments that have been pitch tracked and rhythm tracked and spit that out to music notation uh, and finally get a band to, to play the results. Um, today I really want to talk about the music as much as I can because I always get this question of like what are you actually doing? Why does it sound like this? So I'm gonna hopefully spend most of the day talking about music but really quickly uh, to go through some of the technical details of the process. Uh, the, the source separation phase um, uses a machine learning algorithm to effectively isolate the individual instruments from the mix. So this means you have an original song, uh, how do you get the voice, how do you get the bass, how do you get the guitar, how do you get the drums? Um, there are lots and lots of different ways of doing this, from computational auditory scene analysis approaches to machine learning approaches, uh, approaches, approaches that work on uh, Fourier domain analysis, um, cochlea domain analysis. Um, I happen to use an approach that is a machine learning based approach and it works on an FFT based analysis. Uh, the reason I'm using this approach is because I'm really interested in this idea of machine learning. Uh, and the way it works in my particular setup is I use a corpus or I train the machine learning classifier on clips from the, ori from the original song. So I get an isolated piece of the guitar, isolated piece of the drums, bass. Um, I just need a tiny clip and use this to train a classifier that then splits apart the entire mixture. Um, here's kind of an example of what it might sound like. So here's the full mix. It's just the voice. That's the guitar. I think that's the drums. Piano, the bass, and the choir. Um, so it works. It works okay. Sometimes it works better than others. Uh, but I'm interested in this space from working to not working. I'm interested in the kinds of artifacts that you get when things bleed together. Uh, and in particular, I'm really fond of thinking about machine learning uh, sort of as building hypothetical worlds and then listening through them. I like to ask questions like, what does Bruce Springsteen's E Street Band sound like if you've never heard a guitar before, if you only know what you know, uh, symphonic strings sound like? So it's being a bit hypothetical, a bit imaginary, uh, imaginative with this idea, uh, but this is sort of how machine learning plugs into what I do. The second stage is transcription. So this means taking the extracted uh, instruments that are full of artifacts from the machine listening process of source separation, um, finding pitches, finding rhythms, uh, this involves having to first know what you're looking for. Uh, that means coming up with an idea of what pitch is or what rhythm is, what loudness is, um, and knowing it well enough that you can write it 
and execute it at a machine level. Um, so of course there are lots and lots of different ways of defining all of these different uh, parameters. Largely, the task in this stage of the process for me is sort of translating from the resolution or time scale of machine analysis to that of human performance. And I think I computed it once that if you have an analysis window with a hop of about five, not about, of 512 samples, it comes out to 172nd point 27th notes at 120 BPM. So too much information. So this is a stage of sort of parsing something out of that information, carving something out of that information that looks like music. Um, the music notation phase is then taking uh, all of this data, this music data, and squeezing it into music notation, music syntax. Uh, this is asking questions about, okay, when is it useful to notate something as a 13th tuplet, and when should it just be 16th notes or 8th notes? So here's an image um, that kind of illustrates the stages of the transcription process. Um, the first graph is the source separa separation stage. Um, blue is the extracted guitar, gray is the mixture. Uh, I then show the pitch tracks, the rhythm tracking, and finally the rendering into music notation. I actually blocked out the words because I wanted to do this. So here is an example uh, of that guitar track. This is a computer rendering, not a human rendering. Does anybody know what song that is? Does anybody want to guess? Okay. <laughs> it kind of makes sense, right? Now that you can hear it. <laughs> okay. So. I know, right? You're getting it. So uh, here's what a, a typical score might look like. Um, so a few things look funny. The first thing that looks funny is there's a bunch of little numbers everywhere. Uh, those are scent deviations. Um, so each attached to every node is a scent deviation uh, that indicates, you know, microtonal scent deviations in, uh, you know, hundreds of a semitone. Um, and also, you know, the rhythmic complexity. Uh, that one's, you know, I'd say that's medium on the Happy Valley Band scale. Uh, sometimes they're full of, you know, all sorts of irrational, and I even recently started doing uh, incomplete tuplets, but we won't talk about that today. Uh, and so then the final stage is giving something that looks like this to a band, to human performers uh, to play. So that's the music performance stage. Um, anybody recognize that one? <laughs> the karma stage? Uh, I thought you might get that one. Um, so yeah, when we play, there's music all over the place because the music is just, there's too much of it. There's too much information, there's too much detail. Uh, you can't possibly play everything. Um, and so there ends up being a degree of indeterminacy that comes from this over-specificity uh, because it's simply impossible to play all of the information. So performers end up picking and choosing on their own what to focus on. Um, and it can change from performance to performance. Someone might, you know, really get these notes this time, but get those notes at the, ne the next time. And so there's this sort of degree of, I guess I'll just say it again, indeterminacy um, to every, every performance. Enough, enough, enough. Um, let's just look at the music. So here are a bunch of excerpts uh, of, of the Happy Valley Band music. So uh, here's a piano excerpt from a tune that we do called This Guy's In Love With You. Um, so when I was talking about translating from the scale or resolution of machine analysis to that of human analysis, usually that involves filtering out some of the notes because we're working at a time scale of uh, machine analysis that's far beyond what humans are gonna play. Uh, but for this one, I left in as much of the stuff as possible uh, because the pianist is just really good. Uh, this is for Joe Kubera, who's a just phenomenal pianist. So all of the uh, grace notes are just as much of the extra junk as I could squeeze in there as, as possible. Uh, here's an excerpt of It's a Man's World, um, a James Brown tune that we do. Uh, and so this is the opening timpani roll. If anybody is like hearing the original song in their head, it's just a single timpani roll. It doesn't sound like this, it doesn't look like this. Uh, but what's going on here is I was interested in all of the minute um, small changes in, in fluctuations in spectra uh, that occur if you analyze the spectrogram of this original timpani roll. So I just set the tracking thresholds to be very, very sensitive uh, and it ends up 
looking something like this. We, re we the, the percussionist that performs it does it still on one drum, but it's just like he's constantly foot pedaling. It's really funny. Um, I try to edit the music as little as possible, which kind of sounds like a crazy thing to say, uh, because I'm not interested in my idea of what someone can play. I'm interested in their idea of what they can play, because I don't know the bass as well as my bass player. I don't know the violin as well as my violinist. Um, so I'm more interested in getting their interpretation of trying to grapple with this impossible music, or I should say over-specific music, than my interpretation of filtering it so that it is possible. Um, in this case, there's a note that was just way too high. The pitch tracker just jumped, you know, way off the staff. So I just borrowed a notation from Christian Wolf, which is a little uh, triangle note head. That means as, as high as possible. So I'm kind of passing it through to the bass player and letting him figure out what he wants to do with that. Um, as far as going from tune to tune, there's not one universal way uh, that I kind of set up all of the analysis parameters. I change it from tune to tune. Um, and I change it with a lot of different things in mind. Uh, in this case, this is a transcription of the electric guitar part in Ring of Fire. Uh, and it's just palm muted quarter notes, single notes, not chords. Um, and so to my ears, that was functioning almost more like a rhythm instrument than a melodic or harmonic instrument. So in doing the transcription, I said, well, let's really crank the knob towards rhythm, forget about pitch. So I made it more sensitive, uh, more concerned with rhythm than with, with pitch. So in a way, the analysis is sort of a way of focusing attention on different parameters. Um, people always ask like what works and what doesn't work because we have a whole backlog of tunes that we don't play because they sound terrible. When you hear the music, you're going to be confused about what I just said. You're going to say, doesn't it all just sound terrible? Um, and tunes work and don't work for lots of different reasons. Uh, in, in this case, one thing that really helps listeners, I find, is when songs change instrumentation, when you can kind of follow what's going on um, by something other than the harmony or, or the melody. Um, so in Ring of Fire, for instance, it doesn't really matter uh, what the trumpets play so much as that they come in when they're supposed to come in. Um, Probably the most ridiculous thing about doing this was we made a recording. Uh, and when we made this recording, we hired a bunch of freelance musicians to play this music. Um, so what kind of musician would you get to play this music? I was once taken aside by a conductor uh, and accused of writing too diffi a, a horn part that was too difficult. And he sort of chewed me out and said, who do you think you are? You, performers will do this for M Morton Feldman, but they won't do this for you. You know, you're going to embarrass the performer. Um, and I said, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Uh, and when the French horn player arrived, um, I said, Dan, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Uh, the part's crazy. I'll, I'll fix it. I'll revise the part. And he just looked at me and said, no, I learned it. It's fine. <laughs> I can play it. Um, so that, that's who we got to play this music. So this, this is the horn part for, for, for Dan Costello. Um, in this case, this is an excerpt from the end of like a prayer. And I was listening to the mix and I was trying to figure out what the original instruments uh, are in the percussion. There's this auxiliary percussion that enters at the end of like a prayer. Um, and I, I couldn't figure it out. And I asked my drummer, I said, is that a timbale? Is, I don't actually know what a timbale is. Like what's going on here? Um, and I couldn't figure it out. So what I ended up doing was training a machine learning classifier to do it for me. So I trained a machine learning classifier on the entire set of general MIDI sounds, the general MIDI percussion sounds, and then just let it loose on the music and let it figure out uh, what the instruments were. Um, sometimes the music is thoroughly transformed and sometimes it's less transformed. Uh, this is an example uh, where it's pretty, pretty thoroughly transformed. This is a transcription of the electric guitar part to In the Air Tonight, which if anyone uh, knows the tune, it's sort of just this long glissando. Um, the new part is not at all anything like a glissando. Uh, I tuned it just to be really, really sensitive uh, to small fluctuations, and it ended up kind of jumping all over the part, the place. Uh, this last excerpt, people kind of say, why do, you, why do you do it, which is what you'll say in a second after you hear it. Uh, and the answer is that sometimes you, we find just really, really musical things. Uh, and it's, it's just these amazing moments it's almost like magic. We say, "How did? Where did that come from?" Uh, and this is this is one of them. Um, this is a string part. Um, 
again from the same tune from In the Air Tonight. Um, and it's taken, there aren't any strings in the original. Uh, it's a transcription basically of sort of the reverb on the synths. Um, so I'm kind of digging way into the noise floor here and this popped out and it just happens to be one of the most gorgeous little ditties that I've ever heard. So as I mentioned, we went ahead and we recorded this music. Um, the thing that was kind of a challenge about the recording was uh, we hired a whole bunch of extra musicians. So prior to this, the Happy Valley Band had just been a group of close friends. But when we went to make this record, we decided that we wanted to do it right. So we hired a whole bunch of freelancers, um, which was a nightmare because how do you respond to a New York City freelancer when they look at your music and say, this is insane. You know, like, what do you want me to do? Do you really want me to play this? Um, and so this process of working with these performers, uh, sort of integrating them into the core group, has been me directly confronting the sort of artifacts and idiosyncrasies um, of the machine listening process. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and play you a little excerpt, a little overview of, of the record, if I can find the play button. And play. <laughs> That's what it sounds like. Um, we went ahead and released this record, uh, and it sort of it was kind of it kind of jarring for me uh, because it sort of ripped me out of my reality. I've been so used to this sort of I came up in this tradition of experimental music um, that it never occurred to me to ask what is what does it sound like. Uh, and reviewers they were very concerned with what it sounded like. So here are some of the responses that that we've received. Uh, and the best response um, up top uh, came from a, a reviewer, uh, an email thread, um, where he was basically apologizing for writing a scathing negative review. Um, and he said, you know, I, did, I found the project so, so conceptually fascinating, but I could not listen to it. Like, I'm impressed with how thoroughly I could not listen to it. It's pretty much what he said. Um, he was so, so turned off. He had such a negative uh, visceral reaction. Um, and my response was, of course, oh, that's fine. Like, don't worry about it. We, we feel that way, too, sometimes. And he said, oh, OK, that, made, that, makes me feel, that makes me feel better. Uh, here's an email I got. We tried to put this up on streaming, uh, and we were immediately rejected. Um, so we try, I, think we, I think we tried to put it up on Tidal. Uh, and yeah, we were, uh, there's an automatic search that finds copyright material, and we, were, we weren't even taken down. We just weren't even, we didn't get anywhere. Um, I'm going to hold off on playing a full tune, because I don't think we have time. But it's all on the internet, so you can hear it. Because I want to address kind of this last this last thing, um, which are just, that's also, that's a joke about the music being copywritten. Um, so I spent a long time doing this. This project has been over, over seven years in the making. Um, and it's been this process of sort of wrestling with the differences between machine listening uh, and human listening and human performance. Um, and there's a few things that I've really come to believe. Uh, as a result of this. And those are, um, one, that I spent so much time with these algorithms and listening to the output of these algorithms that I really came to know their, how they functioned. I came to understand or hear, I wouldn't say understand, understand at some level uh, the sort of idiosyncrasies of them. Um, but moreover, it wasn't just me, my bandmates who had no interest, actually explicitly have no interest in computers, uh, started to understand how the algorithms were functioning. My bass player would look at a page and say, oh yeah, that's, that's the part where the pitch tracker does the thing. It looks weird like that. So they came to a kind of intuitive musical understanding um, of how these algorithms were functioning just through playing and listening to them. Um, the second thing is, in response to the reviewer who said, I can't stand to listen to this, uh, I told my partner and she said, he just hasn't listened to the album enough times. Um, <laughs> 
which prompts me to say, only share the fact that uh, I, I really believe that our hearing is malleable. Uh, I really believe that we can learn to hear things differently. Um, I've spent so much time listening to the music this way that I, I really, I hear it this way. I can't really imagine hearing it any other way. Um, it is something that seems to have rubbed off on other people who have spent a lot of time uh, with the music. So it just leads me to believe that um, we need to, or artists or creative types or whoever it is, uh, there's, a, there's room and a role for people to use machine listening technologies or whatever sort of you know, machine perception technologies whenever a machine algorithm stands in for a human process um, to use it to kind of expand how we, how we think about things, to expand how we hear things, to expand how we see things, to expand how we do any cognitive task. Um, and I think, it's, I think that's an overlooked uh, agenda is all I'll kind of say there. I think there's, that's sort of the room and role for artists working with this technology. Um, and I think the biggest barrier to it at the moment, or maybe not anymore, but at the, that moment was accessibility to the tools, um, and which is something that is starting to change. So I think I'll stop there. Are there any questions? <laughs>